Go on, remind me, please. Um, all right. Take whatever we're on here. All right. So, Hey, Nate, we can't hear you if you're talking. Nate, we still can't hear you. What about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I had a quick, I had a quick question. Sorry, before you get started. Yes. Um, the lecture from Tuesday. Did you record that one? I did. Um, so I uploaded it on Tuesday, but apparently forgot it to put it in the uh, playlist, and so uh, it should now be up there. So you should be able to access that. Um, in the future, if you notice that it's not there, email me to let me know so I can put it in the playlist, but also just look on the main uh, page and it should be there. So I try to do that after class every day, but okay. yeah, it should be there now. Thank you. Of course. Um, yeah, so again, just think about what's the information you're trying to convey uh, and then portray it uh, appropriately. All right. I already talked about this. Um, yeah, so at the end of the class, we'll do the more specificity thing. And I'll also try to work on not being an idiot who tells you all not to study things that turn out to be on the exam. Like I sent the email, apparently I told you all not to uh, study the anatomy of the eye and the ear, but that was obviously on the exam. So I gave you all points back for that. Um, could you? All right. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, could you? You briefly recap what was on that first slide because I think everyone not on the zoom in might have missed that. I can. Um, so the main idea of this first slide is just that whatever narrative you're trying to tell or whatever story your data is telling, make sure you're using the right graph, right? And so it doesn't make sense to use something like you have in the top left with a line if your variables, if your x-axis is um, a discrete variable, right? And so if you're measuring UAH versus UAB versus UA Tuscaloosa, it doesn't make sense to have a continuous line because it's conveying that there can be information between UAH, UAB, and Tuscaloosa uh, when obviously there's nothing in between functionally. Um, so that was all I covered on it. It was just serving to highlight the fact that uh, you'll see a lot of publications with graphs that don't make much sense if you think about them logically of using a bar graph and a line graph makes more sense, vice versa. 
Um, you can also start getting into a lot more complex graphs, you know, these hierarchical uh, or connection graphs, heat maps, things like that, making sure you're just using them appropriately. All right, today we're talking about controls. But first, what did we learn last time? Display. <laughs> okay, we did learn about displays. Yes, and what do we learn about displays? That they are one way, whereas in our Yeah, exactly. So a display is a unidirectional um, system. It's just giving information to the user. It's not receiving information from the user, whereas a, an interface does receive information. What else did we learn? Yeah, yeah, so you have to use certain display principles such that the displays make sense, right? And so using iconography that maybe is very familiar, so using a stop sign to convey some sort of stop, which should make sense. Dennis says using gestalt uh, grouping principles are helpful in grouping similar display information to reduce effort, exactly. Yeah, so where in possible group information together, so I know on my control or on my dashboard, I can go to a specific area and get all the information related to speed or all the information related to fuel consumption, etc. We also went over attentional, memory, uh, mental models, and perceptual um, principles of displays. And so make sure that for the exam, you're familiar with these and know how to actually apply them. So if I were to ask a question of come up with a display you interact with every day or an interface you interact with every day, tell me why it's a crappy design. I want you to be able to say, relating back to these principles, why it's a crappy design and not just because I hate it. All right. Here's your fun fact of the day. Editor Bennett Cerf challenged Dr. Seuss to write a book using no more than 50 words. The result was green eggs and ham. There you go. Also, don't procrastinate. If you are writing the Human Factors Disaster paper, make sure that you are getting started on it now so it doesn't come up at the very end of the semester. I always like to have this kind of midpoint reminder that it's not the best thing to wait until everything is due. All right, I've already spent too much time beforehand, so you can just watch this video. It's not important, but it is funny. All right, so we're talking about controls today. And your book does a nice job of kind of laying out a very specific table for what type of controls would make sense in different um, tasks, right? In different control tasks. So when you've got something like a discrete control task, where you've got two states, right, an on and an off. It makes sense to do something like a push button or a toggle switch. Doesn't really make sense to use a joystick to communicate that information. Wherein you've got another state, it makes sense to put some sort of selector switch in there, right? And so you can see when it's a discrete type of task, it makes sense to have some sort of discrete response mechanism, right? Push a button, flip the switch, move the stick in your car. But you can also have continuous control tasks. And so we'll talk about the different, um, you know, potential issues associated with these continuous control tasks, but wherein you have continuous control it makes sense to have a mechanism by which we usually uh, use for this continuous control, right? So a joystick or a mouse, potentially even a round knob. And so just as we had these different uh, design principles for displays, we similarly have design principles for, let's go. 
Uh, we similarly have design principles for um, controls themselves. And so one of these attentional principles is proximity uh, compatibility. So put controls next to each other that have relevance for one another, right? So you can see what Microsoft has done here. They've even provided a label for these groupings, right? So you have all the illustrations, you have things related to images, things related to text, et cetera. All right, so centralize the area such that people know if I want to do anything with text, I have to look over here. That way I don't have to remember what the icon looks like. I can go there and now reduce the search associated with it. Similarly, you want to avoid resource competition. All right, so again, going back to the whole multiple resource theory, our attentional resources are finite. And we need to be able to offload information where appropriate. So on my Tacoma, Actually, I don't even know where it is. Oh, there it is. They have a voice command control, right? Such that I can now push a button and provide commands rather than having to go through. So if I want to call somebody on the road, I can issue that command verbally rather than having to go look through my touchscreen display and place a call that way or find my phone because that is preventing me from devoting the visual resource for um, safe maintenance. It also helps to distribute controls to the right and left hand, right? So don't put all the controls just on the right side. I think we have a propensity to say, okay, if you're right-handed, let's just put all the controls over there. But as long as it's not fine motor control, we tend to be just as good with our left hand as our right hand if we're right-handed and vice versa if we are left-handed. Right, so you can see on both sides of the steering wheel, I have controls that I can leverage. Obviously also make them accessible, right? So one of the things I've done uh, in my research, as I think I've talked about is work with a Tesla for um, evaluating the human automation interaction. That'll be a whole lecture we talk about in I think next week. Um, but one of the issues with this is that the stick required to engage the automation is non-visible, right? So you either have to shift around in your seat to find it or feel around. And the problem is when you feel around, there are two other sticks back there. And so you have to make sure that you're grabbing the right one. Right? So it has to not only be easily reached, but also has to be easily identifiable. Right? So whereas it kind of forces in the Tesla blind operation, it doesn't necess uh, necessarily kind of promote that blind operation in the sense that it takes a little bit of knowledge to know which stick you are manipulating, right? And that matters for when we talk about human automation interaction, things like uh, mode confusion, right? And so if I'm in the Tesla and I think I've just engaged the auto driving and I take my hands off the wheel and feet off of the pedals, and now the car is just gonna straighten out, and it's not gonna actually follow the road, we've got an issue. And that happens a lot more than you would think. <clears throat> Can you also detect when their state changes, right? Is there some sort of feedback? Whether it's haptic feedback, you can feel the button push. Or, you know, with, I don't remember 
what generation iPhone went to this. But now the little button on the bottom of iPhones doesn't actually click, right? And you notice this when you turn off your phone, it doesn't actually depress, but it gives you the feeling of clicking whenever it's on, right? And so Apple realized that if they could minimize the moving parts associated with that button, it was going to be longer lasting, but they still had to provide some sort of feedback, right? And so they gave that kind of fake sensation of that button actually clicking to still maintain that feedback. So again, you're gonna to have to make them discriminable in the sense that you have to know the difference between the different controls. As such, you wanna minimize the amount or the proportion of features shared. All right, so one thing designers love to do is standardize the look of things. The problem is standardizing the look also standardizes the feel and makes it harder to discriminate. Right. In my Tacoma, again, the wheel to turn on the air in the cab is the same as the wheel to turn it into four-wheel drive. Yeah, great, huh? <laughs> yeah, so I can be cruising down you know, Memorial Parkway, think I'm turning on the air conditioning, and wreck my differential. So you should avoid an ejection handle feeling anything like what you have for landing gear. I think at the beginning of class, I talked about the um, civilian who got the ride along in the French fighter aircraft who held on to the handle and accidentally ejected themselves. I don't remember, there was some other, um, I don't think it was France, although we're gonna just blame France on this one too. Um, that uh, designed a cockpit such that the control for ejection felt identical to the control for landing gear, such that the pilot, as they were coming in for a landing, pulled what they thought was the lever for the landing gear, but accidentally ejected themselves from the aircraft. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the engineers always blamed uh, the stupidity of the human, but the rest of us say, don't design it like that. So you can have what look almost cartoonish, but clever additional designs for these handles, for these controls. You can make them actually feel like what they're controlling, right? So you can have a control for the landing flap actually feel like a landing flap. I can put my hand on it and not have to look down and see, okay, am I going to eject myself? The landing gear feels like a wheel. Right, so making sure that when you have these sorts of control mechanisms, you're preventing any sort of confusion that could cause issues. Uh, Dennis says, I believe Toyota squares off their windshield wipers versus cruise control is round. Mercedes cruise control is much smaller than any other lever off the steering column. Yeah, and so there are attempts in a lot of these cases to make things um, discernible. But one of the issues I've always had with having these control sticks um, is that the differences you'll notice in the control sticks only exist in areas or in ways you're not engaging the stick, right? And so with a lot of things, you know, if you have to pull it towards you, you're not grabbing the end of it and pulling it towards you. Now, when you're doing things like turning on the windshield wipers, you do square it off, exactly. But, you know, in cases where you have to pull it towards you, it doesn't really matter how big it is if, you, if your hand is in the right spot, right? You're engaging it in the same way. And so thinking about not only what does this look like, but how would people actually use it, right? If the end of these um, controls that we have here, you know, are at the end of, you know, a six inch lever, 
and somebody just pulls the base of the lever, it doesn't really matter how it feels up top or how it looks up top, because the periphery is telling them they're pulling the lever for a rounded control, but not giving them any sort of that feedback. And so as we talked about with displays, you also want to leverage uh, redundancy gain, right? So wherein you can create a dual source of information, both in the feel and the look of the control, you want to leverage it. Right, I think Dennis came up with a great example of, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but some auditory equipment um, that, uh, or excuse me, studio recording equipment that had different colors for the buttons, but also had different shapes for the buttons, right? And so that sort of redemption makes it a lot less likely that you screw up in the actual control. I don't know why I always use beer tap handles. I don't drink, but it's a good example. So again, as with the displays, people are really, really, really bad at absolute judgments. You know, if you need to, um, have people make judgments, have them make them relativistically, compare them to other things. And we tend not to be better, or we tend not to be good at discriminating between more than like five to seven per code, right? And so when I say code, what do I mean? Some codes, like, each, have a, each way of doing something, like, they differentiate the color one way, by shape, another way, those are, like, codes? Yeah, to a degree, yeah, you have those different codes, but also think within kind of the multiple resource theory uh, box, right? And so, if there's some visual component that I need to differentiate, try not to overload that visual differentiation. Try to, you know, if possible, exploit one of the different modalities, but yeah. More specifically, when you've got things like vision, where you can attend to different sources of information, the color differentiating from the shape, but try not to overload that. It also helps to incorporate those little kind of dents that you feel in turning knobs, right? And so if you've ever uh, owned a car that just has a normal uh, a wheel without any of those kind of haptic feedbacks, those little pivots, those dents, or whatever you would call them. It, you kind of have to look at the screen to make sure that you know you're not turning it up 50 points to blast it. Right? I can. The only good thing in my truck is just kidding. It's lovely. Um, that when I turn the knobs, I can feel that click, and so I know I've been able to kind of calibrate. All right, you know, three clicks is going to give me roughly the volume change that I want. Also, have memory principles for these controls. All right, and so where possible, offload the operator, offload the user. Make it such that when I push a button, I know what the state of that system is based off of the state of that button in the real world. I push it down, I know it's on. I push it again, it pops up. I know it's off. Or you could illuminate it, right? So you push the button, a light comes on. If you're using buttons or controls that have the same resting, 
state at all times, you may have an issue with turning on or off systems that are not supposed to be toggled with. Which could, in certain situations, cause catastrophic issues. One of my biggest pet peeves is also when there's a lack of consistency to the type of controls. Right? You want to do all you can to standardize to a certain degree such that the operator doesn't have to go through and think about how do I need to deal with this. Right? Think about how frustrating it is when you get a rental car and get in and try to figure out how to turn on or off the headlights the wipers, or even some of the cars now have very different ignition mechanisms, right? So you have the typical, just turn the key, turn on the car. Some, you just have to have the key in the car and push a button. Some, you actually have to put it into a little slot to then push the button. Often those little slots are hidden, so you don't really know what to do. But also think about these three-way lights you have maybe in your house or your apartment where it's not the case that the up light switch is always indicating the lights that are on, right? And so sometimes you go through, I've lived in my house for a year and a half now and I still can't figure out the order of the light switches because like three different light controls are those three-way ones and I can't figure out which one is on or off at any given time. Yeah, and it goes back to the display uh, components we talked about last time of have the odd one out be the one that's obviously representing an issue or a different state. Well, I, I've noticed, a, well, can you hear me, Nathan? I can. I've noticed, and I, I'm going to go back to recording just because that's something I do in my spare time, but there are new uh, recording software that because so much and I and it Apple might be the, to blame but so much as far as volume control is going to a rotary knob and I'm used to the old school mm. linear fader and there is mm. a certain amount of frustration when I use something I'm I expecting a linear fader for my volume and then I have to go and twist my my hand or, or, or use the mouse to twist something in a different way. And that's, you know, humans that are, you know, that it goes back to that memory. We, we do not like change when we're used to. Yeah. And we'll talk about some principles coming up here that also complicate that. But yeah, anytime you have that change, that presents a real issue. And so you have to be sympathetic to that when you're brought in to potentially consult or help redesign a system that, Frequently, you're dealing with users who have already been using that system for a long time, right? And so um, one of the projects when I was at the Air Force Academy was to try to revamp the Air Force's mission planning software, right? They had this really old, antiquated, what looked like late 90s, early 2000s mission planning software. <clears throat> and we were, you know, talking with the users and trying to get their expectations and what things they wanted and the capabilities. And one recurring theme is, I don't want you to change it, right? We know the system sucks but it sucks in a way that I know, right? So don't make me relearn a system altogether to try and control what I want to control, right? And so thinking about that standardization, not just within a system, but between systems, et cetera. So we already talked about the stupidity of a lot of these stovetop designs. But the controls need to have some sort of compatibility to the mechanism that they're actually controlling. All right, and so what you can see here are five different stovetop designs. The configuration such that which knob 
controls which burner. And then uh, in this study itself, the error rates, right? And so you can see that when you've got a linear mapping like this, nobody makes mistakes, right? That's a very easy thing for people to pick up on. Okay, the outside control the backs like that. I mean, it's still a very easy logical rule to follow, but unless you're devoting mental resources to it, you're not gonna be able to quickly and easily and accurately turn on these burners. In addition to the compatibility of location, we have the compatibility of movement, right? So the direction of movement of a control should correspond or be congruent with the direction of movement of what it's controlling, of the display, of the indicator. Right, so you never want to have something like we have over here on the left, wherein I rotate a dial left and right to move something up and down. That takes a mental rotation for users. That's ill-advised. On the other hand, on the right-hand side here, you can see that when I move the wheel up, the indicator goes up. What, what about, um, I've noticed this, especially playing video games where I use inverted for the, the the y axis and mm -hmm. other people use regular and we every time if we're playing a game together and we pass the controller i have to switch it where because i started playing first person shooters with inverted i'm used to that but it is it's one of those things so that control has to be switched every time we take a turn yes because it it takes so much kind of uh, relearning to just flip what you're trying to do with that actual control. Um, yeah, so I guess what? It's been a while since I played first person shooters. So inverted means when you move the stick up, you look down. Yeah, it's kind of, it's almost like flight control. And I, and I blame probably my age. I don't know if it's a correlation with, with age or a generation thing, but I think probably using joysticks in the 80s and like old school Microsoft Flight Simulator and stuff like that, where almost everything was, uh, the, the default was inverted. And so you learn mm -hmm. how to do it. And now with most video games, you, you don't use inverted. That is not the default. It's just regular. And so I have to always yeah. switch it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can also see this. Um, I suspect it's the case on all uh, laptops that have a trackpad, but I know definitely on Apple that uh, five years ago or so, they changed the direction of scrolling with the same movements. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar, it's I can't even remember what it is now. I think when you scroll up, it's like you're taking the page and moving the page up. It used to be the case that when you scrolled up, it was an indication to the system that you wanted to be looking up, and so it would move the page down. And so you can actually flip this uh, in Apple, and I suspect it's on these other systems as well, where you can toggle it on or off to be that different direction, and you can see 
how disorienting it is. Even when you know that you flipped it, it can still be really tough to convince yourself this is the direction I need to move my hand to get this to go the other way. And the reason they made that switch is because they realized that it's a kind of default expectation for users that when I move up, it's just like me pushing something away, right? So I'm pushing the page away from me or I'm pushing it up in such a way that I want to go down, right? So they made that flip, which sucked for a lot of users that had already been using it and learned that system, but they realized that that was gonna make it much more user-friendly for people coming to the system from the get-go. So I have an example of this and how it's impacted my life recently. My dad um, has a yeah. and he, he's been teaching me to drive the tractor to help him move bale, uh, baled hay around. And the fork that you use to like stick the bale of hay and pick it up off the ground on the back of the tractor, it moves up, down, and then forward and backward. And the control, however, you have to move like forward, backward, right, and left. And I'm sure once mm. you have like memory and you, it's just instinct and you know which way to move it, which is where he's at because he's been driving his tractor for years. But I spent like three hours one night moving bailed hay around and it was still like I was having to think through it every single time because it wasn't intuitive and I don't remember now how it worked but it's like you moved it forward to go up or backward to go down and then tilting forward and backward was right and left so there's just like no connection whatsoever to the movement of the handle and then the actual movement of the fork yeah, and it's incredibly frustrating when you have that happen, right? And so you can think about what are the ways in which they could have redesigned that tractor to be more user friendly, right? Could they have had some other system that's controlling it in a way that is more intuitive? Because you're right. I mean, your dad, who's been using this tractor for however long he's been using it, has gotten to the point now where he feels comfortable using it in that capacity. But for any new user, it's incredibly frustrating and it presents, presents a potential danger uh, you know, anytime you think you're moving a system in a specific way and then, you know, you accidentally flip a cow instead of picking up the bale of hay. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I dropped like multiple bales of hay because I didn't, like I, I was moving it the opposite of the direction I wanted to. Unfortunately, there were no safety incidents, but there very well could have been. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, another kind of uh, example in that line is if you've ever towed a trailer or anything behind you, to get that trailer to move in a specific direction takes a kind of counterintuitive mechanism for moving the wheel. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what are the ways in which you could design a system, and one of the things they've done is uh, a little add-on you can put on the bottom of your steering wheel such that if you move it to the right, your trailer goes right. If you move it to the left, your trailer goes left. And so trying to engineer those types of solutions, um, so you're not having to create this kind of mental representation of what I had to do of always thinking about, okay, if I'm moving it to the left, I'm like punching the trailer away so it goes to the right. Uh, yeah, that's a great example. It's a perfect example. It also matters that the mental representation of what you have, um, oh, sorry, Dennis. Uh, would that be system one and system two? Um, yeah, more or less, yeah. Is it kind of instinctual, right? So system one, I move it up to go up, I move it down to go down. Or system two, creating that sort of deliberate thought process of, okay, moving it right really means I'm moving down. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and this is the be all end all complaint I have uh, about my truck in that we have mental representations for what things mean when you turn up the volume or turn down the volume, right? Up and down. The volume on my truck goes left to right. To go from the song, from previous song to the next song, it's typically the case that people, I think, represent it as a left to right progression, but they've done it up and down. But to go to the next song, I have to think about this now, to go to the next song is down. I think they're treating it like a playlist on like Spotify or things like that. So again, you have these mental expectations of all these times I've tried to 
turn down the volume, but instead skip the song. Uh, it's, it's not a big issue, but it's annoying. You also obviously want to put systems or controls rather in a way that they cannot be activated accidentally. Right? I mean, so this lockdown button we have here, they put it in a very convenient location for me to access. But if they had not put this cover over it, chances are a bunch of professors every year would accidentally elbow it and send the school into a panic. Right? So put these systems either in an orientation or with a cover that prevents activa accidental activation. Right? So you can see the example from your book on the top. If you've got something protruding, make it go up and down rather than left to right. Because left to right is something I could easily bump as I walk past. You know, you always see in these movies the control button for launching a bomb. You have to lift the thing up and then push the button underneath, right? Uh, Dennis says, reverse and manual transmissions are the opposite side of first gear of the gearbox. Yes. Yeah, that is frustrating to go down and right to reverse and then up and left to first. Although the lack of standardization, there are some cars wherein you have to push it down to go into reverse, which is next to first. My mom had a car where you had to like pull up on a little lever on the stick to then put it into reverse. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean. That's the hard part. When you get into a new car, you never go for it manual. You don't know how to get reverse. Like, <laughs> exactly, yeah. What were you saying, Dennis? Oh, I was just. Saying that I, I think that they did that on purpose so that you couldn't throw the car into reverse and completely, uh, you know, destroy your transmission. So they put it pretty much completely opposite of where, you know, you're normally, if you're in traffic, you're in first, second, third gear, you're not going to accidentally throw that into reverse and completely just hose your mm -hmm. transmission. So it's kind of purposeful. I get that. And I've often thought that, but my counter to that is it's where sixth gear would be in a lot of cars and so there were a couple times when I was driving manual I thought I was in third but I was really in fifth and so I slammed it down luckily my Acura at the time didn't allow me to go into reverse uh, but yeah I suspect you're right that is probably more frequently the case that you are in the first second third gear range and so preventing from going into reverse there well um, and I, I think that we just made the case for the more prevalence of automatic transmissions. You're exactly right. Yes. Um, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to pitch in an example as well. Yeah. Okay, Please. cool. So, so I, I drive a little bit of an odd car. I drive a Saab um, and I had to get it towed once. And the <laughs> tow truck guy had to ask me how to turn the car on and how to <laughs> use the emergency brake because my key is, it has like a, a really specific shape to it. And you yeah. put the key into a corresponding shape hole um, down where, behind your gear shifter, like down into the right of the seat to turn the car on. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. And so that's just kind of an odd location and an odd shape for a car key, right? And then my yeah. emergency brake, it, it looks like it's kind of just, um, it matches on both sides of the console. So it looks like it's just part of the console in the middle of the car between the driver and passenger seats. So he just didn't even recognize that it was there. That's fascinating. Can you take some pictures of that and send to me? Do you still have that? Yeah. Car? Yeah, no, I can do that. I would love that. Yeah. Those are great real world examples. Thanks for sharing this. Because I wanted to put it in a little bit wrong as a 911 function. Mm. Um, but it also happens to be the same function to call the reception department. So you hit the wrong thing. Uh, all the phones in the entire building start screaming and you can't figure out how to turn off because you're calling 911. Oh, good. It's happened at least three times since I've started working there. Oh, Jesus. Well, it's like the phones here. If you want to dial out, you have to do
but I'm always afraid I'm going to accidentally double tap the one. Yeah. Um, yes. So again, prevent any sort of accidental activation, have interlocking or kind of compounded uh, or sequential operations to activate something. Um, also, if it is a very consequential event, either provide some sort of resistance, right? So you can't just throw it into a certain direction, delay the actual response. So somebody can say, oh, whoops, I accidentally knocked that, or provide some sort of confirmation. Of, Did you really want to do that? You really want to launch a nuke? And so when it comes to the displays, we're going to talk about two different laws, the Hick-Hyman law and Fitz law. And the Hick-Hyman law just says that the uh, speed with which an action can be selected is strongly influenced by the number of possible alternatives. So a Morse code operator has two options, dot or dash. And it's a lot faster for them to register that response, either the dot or the dash, than it is for the typist who has 26 or really more options. And so while I won't have y'all calculate or use the actual calculations of the hick hyman law, the nice thing about it is it can tell you what the additional reaction time cost is going to be for every added option. All right, so it can tell you if you have an emergency screen that pops up, and requires response from a user in two seconds, you can predict how many things you should put on that screen so they're not weighing their options for too long. Right? But it's important to note that the hick hyman law does not say that it's better to force a series of simple actions than a few more complex ones. Right, so that logarithmic relationship of the data suggests that you would be better off having a few complex responses than a bunch of really simple yes, no, dot, dash, etc. Right, so think about it when it comes to Morse code. Right, they're gonna be a lot faster at every individual stroke of the dot dash, but it takes a series of those to produce a single letter. So you're actually better off, you're gonna be faster at that final product of typing on a keyboard than you would be with the Morse code. So it's almost like pay now, pay later kind of thing. You either pay for now with extra time, or pay for later. Yeah, exactly. And it's not always equivalent. It's not like you could either have cost now or that cost later, but where you are on how complex that is uh, depends. Uh, stenographers use a hybrid, which seems to be faster still. Yes, you're exactly right. So stenographers will have keys that represent combination of keys that come together frequently, like pH or things like that. And so you can hit one key to get an even more complex relationship. And this is another fun fact, you get a two for today. Uh, the QWERTY keyboard that we use is actually designed to be inefficient, right? And so it came about initially in the days of typewriters where you ran the issue of if you registered the next response before you completed that first response, you could jam up the arms that were coming and hitting the page, right? And so QWERTY is designed for you to be slow at typing, right? There are actual uh, keyboards that are out there now that are much more efficient, but nobody wants to transfer, right? Nobody wants to relearn how to type. But we're essentially doing something that has very kind of anachronistic ties in that we're typing on this QWERTY keyboard. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you're basically saying you can hit two keys at one time in this? Yeah, so the arms, the way when you look at a typewriter, the arms all lay, right? And then they come up and slap the paper. So if you have two <clears> letters <throat> that come right after each other pretty often, like E and I. If you're typing a word and you hit E, I, they'll jam and cross. Okay. And then they get stuck and you have to like fix it without breaking them off. Yeah, because every arm is angled in such a way that it's trying to occupy the exact same space, the final end of a stroke. Yeah. Um, so you also have what's known as Fitz Law. Right? Fitz Law is beautiful because it's simplistic, but it does a great job at predicting how long it's going to take you to respond. Right? So what Fitz Law says is the reaction time, or the movement time, rather, to register a response is a function of how far you're moving and how big that target is. So if W2, this should be W2 down here. And register. There we go. So if W2 is half the size of W1 up here, it's going to take twice as long to register that response. Similarly, if A2, that distance you're having to move, is bigger, that's also going to increase the response. And the cool thing is that this doesn't just apply to the real world of moving your arms, but it also holds true in computer environments. So how far you have to move that mouse to click a button. Right, and it conceptually makes sense, right? There's obviously the cost of moving in space to a certain direction, but the smaller the response target is, the more precise your micro movements have to be once you get to that, right? So our movements, both for things like saccades or eye movements and our gross motor movements with our arms, we tend to have an initial ballistic movement in the general vicinity of that target and then a lot of little corrections to get us on target. And the cool thing is you can see and critique design out in the real world based off of these principles, right? And so for Windows operating systems, I don't know if this is still the case because I never use it, but um, it has traditionally been the case that you have to move from button to button at a further distance to move that slider if you're not just going to grab and move that slider. You can tell how old this example is because Snow Leopard was how many operating systems ago? Um, and for Max, it was typically the case that they were right next to each other, right? So reducing that movement dramatically reduces the amount of time it takes. Now, one of the things you could also say, though, is that the Mac approach down here violates that sort of um, location or that uh, expectation of where that control should be, right? If we want to move left, we usually look left. We don't look to the right, but just left of the far right. Right, so you can start to see how some of these trade-offs occur. So where possible, provide feedback, right? We've already talked about this a little bit with the state of the button with the lighting, with the location of the switch, right? You can establish that that feedback is either transient or persistent. Transient would be the vibration on my phone when I hit the button, or a click, 
or a sound. Persistence would be a consistent state, right? So I push the button, the light comes on. And the light stays on until I push the button again. All right, so those are all discrete controls. Right, but we also have controls for things like position, right? So more continuous updatings. The order of system dynamics refers to whether a change in the position of control device by the uh, human operator leads to a change in either the position, right? So it's an actual movement. We call it a zero order control. Velocity. So now I'm pushing the throttle up in my aircraft. I'm changing my velocity, not changing my position, but I'm changing my velocity. Or acceleration, which would be second order. Any system that changes the acceleration is going to lead to the issue of oscillations and overcorrections. Right? I'm not going to show this next video because it'll just take time to get it uploaded, but I want you to watch this video um, on your own time. And it's what's known as a pilot induced oscillation. So, one of the things uh, you'll notice in that video is as the pilot comes into land, one wing starts dipping low. That pilot then overcorrects with the stick. That wing now dips low, but at a low, or it doesn't, there's a latency between when they move that stick and when that action occurs. So now they push that stick over even further, which now causes the plane to dip that left wing further down than that right wing was. And now they compensate to the right. And again, you have this latency because it's changing the acceleration rather than changing the position. And so you get into this, you know, awful sort of oscillation that you can also see sometimes on the pitch of aircraft as they're coming in. Too low, too high, too low, too high. Is it not the shutter? Like, I think it was a few minutes before they come to landing, you know, like, that was like that, and I was like, yeah, especially it's kind of shutter side to side, it seems like. Yeah, I don't know how much of the shutter is from control or just aerodynamics associated with it. Um, but yeah, very possibly. It's just anytime you so get the it in the first place, so they're trying to compensate for it. Is that what it is? No. And so it's it's the fact that you have to overcome an initial um, both position but velocity in the rotation of the aircraft towards that right wing. And so by moving the stick to left, it's not like you immediately go to the left. It's slowing down that rotation of the aircraft to the right. And now it's starting to accelerate to the left, but not doing so quick enough. And so that's where you get the extreme overcorrection. And then that vice versa, trying to offset that. Um, but yeah, you'll also notice this, this in your everyday life with uh, like driving on ice, right? So if you're ever driving on ice and you start to slip, chances are you overcorrect because you're not getting the positional or the directional control that you're usually expecting to be right on when you make that movement or that change in movement. That doesn't happen fast enough. You tend to move forward further. As your car then starts to fishtail, you throw it back the other way and overcorrect, etc. So where possible, avoid any sort of these second order controls because they are so hard to deal with. So that closed loop instability, that issue associated with that oscillation and overcorrection can be dealt with by things like lowering the gain, right? So think mouse movement. How much do I have to move 
the physical mouse for one unit change in the position of the cursor on the screen. Right? Make it so that I have to move it a whole bunch to get just a small change. That prevents me from overcorrecting in the role of the aircraft. If possible, and this isn't always possible, but reduce the lags and delays. Right? There are certain things that you just can't reduce the delay associated with a 747 flying. But if you can, try and reduce that lag. You also have a training approach wherein you're cautioning, cautioning the operator to not try and correct every input. Right? Make a change, wait a second. Make a change, wait a second. Allow the system to catch up to what you're trying to control. You can also change your, change your strategy such that you're trying to anticipate and predict rather than react. You can also change it to being more of an open loop system. So what is the difference? Closed loop requires this feedback, right? So you're monitoring performance, you're getting feedback, you're adjusting accordingly. Open loops, on the other hand, are what we call ballistic, right? I provide an input, and then there's no stopping it until that input is carried out. Right, so you can think ballistic like a gun. You pull the trigger, you can't direct that bullet in a different direction after you've pulled the trigger. You hit a baseball, you can't correct where that baseball goes. So we'll skip this, but just think about the application of these sorts of controls, open and closed loops, to things like teleoperation, um, RPAs, remotely piloted aircraft. Here's a big old sales point for why that sucks. Um, all right, so what were the main takeaways from today's lecture? I think one of the main things is that. Um, yeah. I think one of the main things is that, like, um, I guess kind of like perception and how you see like the, the controls. And I think that's the main from like, that was the main point of the lecture. There's controls and touch controls and kind of common sense for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, like, oh, if we move to the right, we can move to the right, move to the left, move to the left. I mean, for example, my work, we have different folders that people are shipping and just put new stuff. Mm -hmm. The newer ones, all the old ones you press forward, you know, it goes backwards, you backwards, left, right, and it will make the force go up and down. Right? Mm -hmm. On the new ones, you got left goes forward, right goes backwards, and this goes forward. So if you get the opposite side, I don't know, I'm going to get one where I'm going. Yeah. It's kind of tense, though, you know, forward, back, and kind of touch. Yeah, have that compatibility to what it's controlling out in the real world. Yeah, what else? Yeah, um, uh, just like uh, just like displays. Uh, a lot of the principles for discrete uh, controls are kind of similar. Like you have attention, perception, mm -hmm. memory, mental models. Uh, for like um, for memory, for instance, um, uh, you emphasize uh, controls should be consistent and standardized. It, it's better for them to be standardized uh, between and within uh, existing systems. Same thing connects to um, displays. Um, uh, attention, the same thing with the uh, controls and display. Um, you want to avoid resource competition, tying back to the multiple resource theory. Um, mental models is similar. Response selection was unique to, to controls, but, you know, again, um, avoiding accidental selection, steps like that, I guess, could be tied into how you would also, you know, connect a display with a control to ensure that, you know, no mistakes are made when you're trying to uh, make yes. a selection or a decision. Absolutely, yeah. So there's a lot of overlap and kind of these principles or applications to both design and the control, right? So again, this all ties back to kind of cognitive principles. What's going on in somebody's mind? Well, that's not gonna change as a function of whether they're receiving information or trying to give information in a lot of cases, right? And so adhering to a lot of these principles is going to look very similar, whether it's for display, or it's for an interface 
um, or these controls. Somebody give me one more quick thing so I can then meet with the Boeing team. Uh, the thing that I, I'm taking away from all of this with displays or with um, controls is you're thinking, I mean, in this whole course, you're thinking about the user and trying to make it intuitive so that mm -hmm. what you do is what you expect or the expectations are met. And that includes providing constant feedback or reducing latency. It all needs mm -hmm. to be intuitive so that what we're, how we're behaving, the system reacts in the way that we think it should. Exactly, yes. And so I, I love the old adage that a good system is one you never notice, right? If it's so intuitive and so easy to use, you don't even think about it being a good or bad system. It just gets there, right? It's just an interface by which you're interacting with whatever the system is, yeah. And so trying to make these things intuitive for the user and understanding what are the cognitive principles that we need to be reliant on to make these systems intuitive. Great. All right. So if the Boeing team could stick around for just a couple minutes, just for a quick tag up. Um, otherwise, everybody have a good weekend. And I will see you all next weekend. Or next weekend. Next week. I'm ready for... Um, <laughs> At least it's October. People have been putting them up on my uh, street for...